I think of imagination as being seeing the world differently. Creativity is bringing imagination to life and art is the product of creativity. Artists like no one else in the world can open up a document on their laptop and a few months later there's a play or a book or a movie, right? Or a poem, or look at a blank canvas and see things that most of us can never see. So there's no one else who is more expert at imagining what the world can be and fixing the future and planning the future and bringing that to life. So as we are in a place right now where there's so many problems in the world, I think art and artists should be brought into all those conversations to help us fix the world. Hello, and a very warm welcome from Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, Executive Director, and today we're continuing our discussion about the arts. How did the arts survive the pandemic and evolve in terms of diversity and collaboration? Some would say it's a story of triumph over adversity, despite the extreme challenges, and it is. But financially and biologically, we're not out of the woods yet. We're also going to take a look at the arts as a prescription for culture. And I use the word prescription advisedly. Research is demonstrating that the arts are essential to our mental health and general well-being, but of equal and perhaps overlooked significance is the economic contribution that the arts and culture make to the US economy. They represent 4.3% of the nation's GDP and 5.2 million jobs. In other words, they surpassed areas like construction, which contributed 892.7 billion to GDP in 2019. To help us understand these issues in greater detail, we have two experts joining us today. Michael J. Bobbitt is the Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council, and Catherine Carr Kelly is Executive Director of Central Square Theatre in Cambridge and collaborator on the Starlight Square project. So welcome to you both. So Thanks Michael. Thanks for having us. <laughs> this is the week that Bell Hooks passed away, sadly. And I wanted to start with a quote from her. She said, uh, the function of art is to do more than tell it like it is. It's to imagine what is possible. So, Michael, arts and culture are important to us. So what does that statement mean to you? Well, first of all, thanks for having me here. And um, certainly the loss of Bell Hooks is a tremendous loss to us. She was a fantastic author and, and feminist and change maker and and i think her um statement is is absolutely perfect because you know the best way we can remember our history and our past and the things that have happened is through art art has always been a social justice tool and if you think about all you think about the way you know history it's through paintings and fashion and books and movies um, at the same time, the second part of our statement um, is so wonderful because it talks about what art does and how art is, is the way that we are going to fix all the world's problems because art is, is a way to imagine the world differently. I think of imagination as being seeing the world differently. Creativity is bringing imagination to life and art is the product of creativity Artists like no one else in the world can open up a document on their laptop and a few months later there's a play or a book or a movie, right, or a poem, or look at a blank canvas and see things that most of us can never see. So there's no one else who is more expert at imagining what the world can be and fixing the future and planning the future and bringing that to life. So as we are in a place right now where there's so many problems in the world, I think art and artists should be brought into all those conversations to help us fix the world. So looking back over the last couple of years, um, art certainly is an agent of, of change, social change. So the pandemic, what did it do to and for the arts and culture? Well, I mean, I think I finished Netflix in August, so that <laughs> that got me through the pandemic. Uh, it got many of us through the pandemic. I mean, I think the the all the digital work that has been 
um, created out there. You, you'll hear a lot, st- a lot of stuff from Catherine later on about some of the work that they've done there. But again, Netflix, podcast, music, um, digital art, all of that uh, helped many of us sort of survive this pandemic. Uh, but it also has hurt us. I mean, we were the first industry closed and the last one to open, and we're looking at another major shutdown as the Omicron variant sort of um, overwhelms us. Um, the last time Mass Cultural Council did a survey was in March of 2021, and it showed that there was $588 million in losses from organizations and $30 million in losses from individuals. That is only the people who filled out the survey didn't include the people that aren't part of our portfolio, nor did it include the private sector too, the, or the for-profit sector. So we know the losses were were tremendous, tremendous. Uh, that's that's difficult. That's hard for us to sort of figure out how to come back from. We're all doing our best and pivoting and making adjustments to our business models and coming up with great ways to earn revenue, but it, it has hit us hard. And I think we're going to have a, a bunch of years to recover from that. I should mention, Michael, that Cambridge, of all the cities in Massachusetts, is only second to Boston in the amount of loss um, due sense. to COVID and the yeah. arts. Yeah, it makes sense with the, with the vast arts. As a Cambridge resident with the vast arts that we have here, I can imagine that all those organizations suffered greatly from the, from the pandemic. So, uh, Michael, you moved to Cambridge. You used to direct, was it artistic director of the New Rep? Um, yeah. This job on. Yeah, I moved here from DC in the summer of 2019, and uh, I don't know if um, if Annie wants to showcase some of the art that um, that exists that I that, that Mass Cultural Council funds in Cambridge. But I moved um, up here to run a theater in in Watertown, and as my husband and I were trying to find a place to live. Uh, we got tickets to um, American Repertory Theater, ART, in Cambridge and decided to come and have dinner. And so we walked around and I was just blown away by all the beautiful public art and every single block seemed to have two or three arts organizations on it. And I turned to him and said, we need to move. We need to move to Cambridge. This is really nice. Not to mention the commute was good, but also part of the reason why I wanted to move here was to be surrounded by art all day and every day. So people tend to enjoy the bountiful aspect of the arts. You know, they like going to museums, the theatre or musical venues just for for pure enjoyment. But they tend to underestimate the economic underpinning of the arts uh, as a force in the national economy. So first, how do we change that misconception? And secondly, do you think that we need to run the arts in a more, and I hate to say this, business-like way? Uh, you said to me at one point that when you ran the new rep, if your play was sold out, you just extend the run. I mean, you just pivot. I hate to use that word. We're all using it. Um, you'd adapt. Um, is that part of the answer that we're too nice in the arts? We're not hard nosed enough. <laughs> well, you know, I use that metaphor to convince my my colleagues in the legislature that they have a great product in the Commonwealth. They have the arts, which really has some magnificent numbers. I thank you for sharing the the national um, statistics, but in the state of Massachusetts, $25.5 billion, that's 4.3% of the state's GDP, and it's 142,000 jobs in total compensation of 13.6. But that's a huge, huge amount of revenue that it it generates. Um, And as you mentioned, it's larger than construction, and most people don't know this, but larger than education services, uh, which is, which is, pretty significant um, for a sector. So I use that just to say that you have a good product in the Commonwealth. And for every dollar that the legislature invests in the cultural sector, we put $5 back into the GDP. That's a great margin, right? And so I use that idea of, of, of double downing. If I have a great show that's selling well, I'm going to extend it and invest more and sell more. And so what I was telling them, they should double down and invest more in the cultural sector and, and, and try to sell more. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the idea of being sort of more hard-nosed and business-like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think some could probably, but it, I think it really depends on the purpose and the mission of the organization. I, I don't necessarily, I think that one of the things we, we do in the cultural sector is we, we try to be 
too business-like and try to keep growing and growing and growing and you lose sight of the mission. Um, so to me, the growth of, the, of, the, of a nonprofit really is based on their mission and their capacity to manage the growth they're intending. Um, so it just depends. And then regarding the message about the economic impact, I think, I think that's the golden question. I have to figure out how to express that data and that language to the legislature to get them to to invest more. I'm not sure. And we've been using the economic impact for a long time in the funding world, especially in the um, in the sort of legislative or government funding world. I'm not sure it goes deep. And one of the things I tell people is that um, I'm not necessarily a sports fan, don't know much about it, even though everyone in my family is. You can come to me and try to tell me all the wonderful things that sports does and the economic impact and the numbers. And I don't know if I'll hear it because I just don't pay attention to sports. So I think I got to figure out how to message it and how to message it uniquely to the different people I'm talking to. I think that's one of the biggest parts of my jobs. Well, Catherine, this is a good time to bring you into the discussion because um, you are running a medium-sized theater, Central Square Theater, which is remarkable, very cutting edge. And uh, it typifies many of the challenges that other theatres across the country had to face. So I'm sure you can talk about that. So you were in this dilemma. All of a sudden, you've got the pandemic. What were the things that you managed to take away from it that were positive, that ignited change in a good way for you and accelerated progress? Perhaps you could tell us a bit about that, how you responded to that. <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> the word pivot. I can do that. Um, well, we, we had to adapt really quickly, um, which I think was in many ways, we, we've always considered ourselves uh, an organization that's flexible and that is sort of just the right size to move quickly when needed. Um, so we were definitely tested by COVID and, and I think we still are. Uh, we were in the middle of a run of Pipeline, which is a production that we'd been, uh, we co-produced with Wham, which is a theater out in the Berkshires. And we'd been looking forward to it for about three years. That's the other thing to remember is that this kind of planning takes a long time. So you're looking at like a two to three year planning cycle minimally. Um, and then COVID hits. And now we're looking at like a three month planning cycle. <laughs> uh, so so we uh, luckily we were in a situation where um, we could literally walk next door and talk to CCTV, which is our local television station, which is excellent, and say, can you bring over a film crew tomorrow? to do to film our last show. We're not sure what we can do with it, but we know we need to have it. And they jumped to it and said, absolutely. And they uh, did a great job with that. It was called, uh, we have a clip of that. I think we'll wait just for a second for that clip. Um, the production was called Pipeline and it was about the pipeline from high school to uh, prison for young black boys. Metamorphic rocks. They change in form, made from heat and pressure. That's what makes the security cameras. They put in if they're not gonna scare off these hoodlums. And who he looking at when he asking all these questions, Ma? Who he looking at? Oh, Ma, like I'm the spokesperson. He felt harassed by the teacher more so than the other students. He felt targeted. They don't care about your Exactly! Mom. They don't care, Ma. They don't care what, what space and place I'm in. So as you can see, we were um thrilled to be able to get it up and online. And I think it was a two week period and edited. And we knew we had a couple of things we had to handle right away. One was how do we remove barriers to seeing the work? We were doing that anyway um, when the show was actually on stage for two weeks. So now it's not on stage, it's on streaming. How do we handle this? So we did a few things. One thing was we made it um, something called pay it forward, which is still our pricing, which is now our, our post COVID or middle middle to end hopefully of COVID <laughs> pricing, which basically allows um, a person to pay uh, within reason pretty much whatever they want. And, and it encourages folks who can pay more to do that and pay that forward to help us um, handle those who, who can't. So we put that into place immediately. We also put into place, you we know, are really worried about our artists. You know, how are they gonna survive um, now that everything's shut down? And we uh, put in a, a version of um, a percentage of all the sales went to the artist directly. Um, and what we found throughout this process was that the audience itself was really large for the stream, which was interesting. 
And it also brought in a more diverse audience than we had seen before. Mm. So it absolutely enabled this play to be seen by more of the folks that we hoped would get to see it. Uh, so that was, those are interesting things to learn. <laughs> now we feel, now we feel like digital work is all about access as we go forward. So we're obviously going to, you know, we film everything we can. Not every, not every playwright will allow their work to be filmed. Mm -hmm. I think there's still some concern about, okay. about filming everything, mm -hmm. uh, but we film everything that we can and we get it out there because it provides access to the work. If, you know, whether it's someone who feels that, uh, not maybe they're not a theater goer. They're not as welcome. Kind of what like Michael talked about with sports. You know, if I can pay five bucks or free <laughs> and put something on my computer for an hour and a half, you know, maybe I'm more, and I think it fits, it has, says something to me. I'm maybe more likely to do that. Uh, so that's one of the biggest things we learned. We're starting to see a lot of data being collected from all the digital work that's been happening in the field. And, and there is, uh, there's a lot of innovation starting to happen as well, a lot of collaborative innovation projects happening all across the country. But one of the things we're seeing is that um, uh, just the notion that when we make technological advances, we don't usually go back. And many of us were thinking about the digital portion of seeing live work, whether it's theater or concert or dancing, as a stopgap to get us through, through COVID. But we're seeing people integrate it more into their regular business practices. I'm seeing people add staff people that are just for digital content, um, hire content creators, invest in technology, software, hardware, um, and really thinking about how to monetize it. I'm also seeing a shift in learning on the marketing side because in the beginning, we were focused on converting our live patrons into digital patrons. But now that we're seeing a larger audience as audience in our digital platforms, we now have to figure out how to convert our digital patrons to come to the theater or come to the venue once or twice a year to experience the work live. So I think that's it's going to keep continue growing. And I think that um, producers and consumers will, will start demanding higher quality and, and better work and more innovation and even more interaction. Because one of the things you can do with the digital media is have a, a, a sense of interaction that you can't quite have in the, in the live venue. I think I think those are great points, Michael. I, I also think in terms of the art, theater and performance world, there is less fear now about, oh my God, you're gonna stay home and watch Netflix. You're never gonna come, you know, you're not coming out. I mean, that existed before COVID. And COVID forced everyone to say, well, maybe that's gonna happen, but we have to be in the mix. And I think what we found, I mean, the fall has been challenging. We had two productions that did well. Uh, we saw maybe 50% of our usual audience and in polling, extensive polling that we've done uh, with a national firm, it, the feeling is that we keep, that audience members keep pushing forward the date that they're going to go back to theater in the way that they normally would. So that's, that's a concern, but it also feels like, uh, like it potentially has an end date. So I think, I think what we found was people who love live theater or dance or music, still love live theater, dance or music. We probably have all seen, right? A music production or anything. I mean, Hamilton, Hamilton was great on Disney and not the same as it was live. And Hamilton's been selling out everywhere because people still are like, I wanna see that, I wanna be in the room. Um, so so I, I think there's been a little bit of a change from the art world anyway, that you know what, we can, do work like this, we can use the technology alongside our work. So lots of things, you've raised re very good mm -hmm. points there. Um, first off, I have to say, I've been to theater three times in Boston in the last month, um, all different venues, and all of them were sold out, the particular productions I'd gone to. One was the 25th anniversary of Rent, one was the new ART, Wild, um, uh, I can't remember where the other one was. Can't remember where the other one was. Anyway, they were, I felt comfortable because everybody was um, wearing masks, tested, ventilation system was good. So I think people are feeling 
more confident about returning to open spaces. That's my feeling. People that love live performance love it and, and you know, are willing to take whatever risk factor there might be. But more than that, let's go back to the point you were talking about. Technology helped save us, no doubt about it. This, this our own program was saved by Zoom because we used to do this as a live audience-based event in Cambridge and Harvard Square. I haven't done that for two years, over two years. Um, so it's definitely been a, a something we've all learned to live with. Um, but the other thing is all sorts of collaborations occurred um, internationally as well as nationally. Um, and I think that's been very enriching culturally for us all to have those collaborations. So one group I discovered during lockdown was the Arlequin Players. They're a Soviet, former Soviet Union-based group of players, and they've been really playing around with this virtual theatre world. Um, the first one was a little strange for me. They did this thing called Chekhov Operating System. Oh, uh, yeah, it was different. It felt more like a game show to me. Than that, was the, that was the second one. The first one. Oh, I the can't first one the, for me. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember the, the, the first one, yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I never seen anything quite like that and, you know, interactive. And But the second one is, is on now, and um, I think we've got a clip of it. I think it's really interesting. Witness. Greetings, passengers of the MS St. Louis. This is your captain, Gustav Schroeder, speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the St. Louis. A thousand foreigners will arrive in the St. Louis. Immediate displacement our workers. Government efforts to alleviate... What? You are not going back to Hamburg. So, I mean, there's lots of things going on there, which I think is just so exciting, uh, the texture of that. But also I like the fact that people are getting used to hearing other accents and other semi-translated, not always translated, like the West Side Story I just saw. There's a lot of Spanish in it that is not translated anyway. It's just like, this is Spanish. And I actually think this has been good for the audience as well as for the people taking part in these collaborations. It stretched us, I think. Yeah, so, and I think what's hard to tell about that clip of Witness is that, if I'm not mistaken, those are live actors performing live every night. And the, the, the stuff you're seeing in the background is, is being superimposed. Mm -hmm. So you're still getting a live experience, but it yes. looks like this filmed piece. And I remember the first time he did something, I, I, I was convinced it was pre-recorded. And then when the actors walked on screen to do a bow at the end, my, my mouth hit the floor. I was just so fully engaged with it and, and had already figured out they had somehow figured out how to get those actors together during lockdown to, to, uh, to film it. But I think you're right. I think what, what is so great about the digital world and I think what's so great about just the internet and technology is that we can really bridge gaps and we can really sort of find all the beauty of culture and, and creativity and that ethnicity and how all of that stuff can be infused into sort of American theater or American art. Uh, to me, it's, it's just a great opportunity. And I, and I, when I, when I think about the possibilities of the digital world meeting the live world, to me, the possibilities are endless. And I think we've just started just started tipping the um, chipping at the iceberg to figure out how deep we can go with all that. So I'm kind of excited about what it's going to look like in five to ten years. Catherine, you want to chip in there? Yeah, I, I well, you had an international uh, collaboration. You said was it the Women in Science project? We or? did. We did. Um, so for years, years before COVID, we 
we have a project called the Catalyst Collaborative at MIT, which we've had since we moved into Central Square Theater, which we built with MIT um, about 15 years ago. So what this does is it, uh, we create or bring in theater uh, about science. And because we're right here and we're partners with MIT, we're able to offer our audiences access to some of the greatest scientists in the world now. Um, and usually that's been like at a pre-show symposium, a talk back after the show, something like that. One thing we talked about for years was we really would like to do a festival, some kind of a science theater festival. And, you know, that's expensive and, you know, a big project. And once COVID hit, we felt that uh, perhaps now <laughs> was the time to do the digital festival that we had not yet been able to do. Um, so we did a month long festival of virtual performances, panels and special events at the intersection of art and science. Um, it was a tremendous success. Uh, we were able to use Zoom in some of the great possible ways, like you could be in a breakout group with a world renowned scientist and a playwright and talk about their art and their work and how there's similarities between the scientific process and the artistic process. Um, so we were able to do that. We were able to commission some short plays. Um, we did some Zoom plays about science. Uh, we have a short, I think, Annie, the video that shows quickly the um, Women in Science Festival. So we involved about a hundred people, which was exciting. Um, and we were able to, by a hundred people, I mean a hundred people involved in the art. You were either on a panel, you were an artist, you were a scientist. And then there's all the people who actually went to the festival. Um, and we reached 33 states, nine countries. Mm. We were able to collaborate and network with folks that we've never been able to do that kind of work with before, super exciting. And, and that brings me to probably our last clip, which is um, one of the plays, and this too is an innovative uh, national project, was uh, the play Catastrophist was created by the most prolific uh, playwright today, Lauren Gunderson. It was created for, written and filmed for uh, Zoom, essentially, as a Zoom performance. It was co-produced by about 35 theater companies which again, does not happen <laughs> all throughout the United States. And we all had access to bring it into part of our digital streaming portfolio. Um, and, and the interesting, other interesting thing is that this playwright's husband happens to be an epidemiologist. So I, I have a short clip on that. I should explain, my wife is a writer. She's writing, I think this, just maybe. Every now and then with a good answer, you get to discover something true. There is, right now, out there, building capacity through the natural trial and error of any evolution, something is evolving right now into something that will be ready for us. Will we be ready for it? Yeah, I should note that that wasn't her husband. <laughs> That's an actor. <laughs> <laughs> her husband is lovely. <laughs> I got to work with Lauren on a Harry Connick Jr. children's musical where she was brought in to fix up the script. She's a, a, a really fantastic, fantastic artist. I'm happy to have had a moment with her. And another interesting point you raise here, um, because the theater does have to work at such a long uh, you know, lead time before a production, I think this technology in this situation has allowed us to be a lot faster and more flexible to respond to things, for example, you know, that was bang on with dealing with COVID and pandemics. And Wilde is talking about climate change very much at the forefront of the debate. Um, so let, that brings me to the next point. We've got a clip we're gonna show you. Um, Future City, which is a London-based organization, um, 
came out recently and said culture came to the rescue in 2021, which uh, I actually agree with. I think so. And they said that public art took on new importance again. Um, people had to find ways, despite all the restrictions, to allow for creative expression, which gives us all a sense of meaning, which I, I would go along with that. And artists staged these ambitious kind of galleries without walls. Uh, all around the world, this went on in public space. One example was to this tremendous puppet who was seven foot tall called Amal, and he represented a young Syrian refugee, and he walked 8,000 kilometers from Turkey to the UK on the way giving stage productions, um, uh, discussions, storytelling, and communicating the predicament of a refugee in a new way to people. So before we ask you about Starlight Square, Catherine, I just think we should watch this clip. So I love that you take the art right out into the community like that to see people involved and connected with it. And it's, it's, very, it's a very dramatic way of symbolizing a refugee in a very kind of visual manner. So Catherine, it's beautiful. What, yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah, it is beautiful. Yeah. So tell me a bit about um, the Starlight Square project and if people sure. don't know about that. Awesome. So this is Starlight Square. Starlight Square um, was the brainchild of Michael Monesty, executive director of the Central Square Bid. Uh, it was actually an idea that the idea of doing theater outside in Central Square has been kicking around for a long time. Um, and it was at the time of COVID, let's see, March 20th was the shutdown. And Michael was able to raise the money along with help from the city of Cambridge and many, many other folks uh, to create Starlight Square, I think by July, we opened in July. Um, as you can see, it's, it's scaffolding and scrim. <laughs> it's something that, you know, it, there are construction pieces, there are uh, theater pieces, there are things that we all, all use um, in a parking lot, lot five, which is right behind uh, H Mart. So it is still up to this day. At that time, um, we were given, I think, I think we ended up having like maybe six weeks to actually program uh, it through the summer for its first year. And it was, um, it was a big endeavor. It was uh, exciting. It was fun to be part of something that felt exciting again. And, uh, and it was, it was somewhat worrisome because at that point in time, you know, COVID was raging and we had to make sure that the safety of our artists and the audiences was primary and it was. I'm happy to say that there have never been any issues around that. Um, so it was really creating a civic, a place for civic meeting in the heart of the community and a place for everyone because you literally could walk through it. Um, everything was free. It was accessible to everyone in every way um, in terms of physical accessibility. Uh, and sound and those things. Um, I think that it served a really important purpose. We, we also looked at, when we thought about the programming for that first summer, it was Central Square Theater, the Front Porch Arts Collaborative, um, which is a black professional theater company, uh, the Dance Complex and Improv Boston. So we looked at and we thought, who, who do we need to, um, who do we need to serve? What do we need to put on? the stage and we felt like it was really important to serve um, 
our black and brown community, folks who were being uh, hit adversely, more adversely than others. And we did that. We did cabaret, we did dance, there were yoga classes, there was um, a science experiment that lasted for a couple performances. Uh, there was a performance of Thurgood, which Michael had worked on um, when he was a new rep. Uh, there were a lot of student work, lots of educational activities. Uh, there were pop-ups. So there was outdoor sales with mostly um, black and brown business people. So it was, it was hugely successful and it's still up to this day. So someone's just come up with a question here in the, uh, I encourage people to ask questions, by the way. Uh, please, if you feel that you'd like to uh, bring any question up now, uh, please use the Q&A uh, that you have. This question is for Catherine. Are you rethinking live performances since the advent of Omicron? I am concerned about it. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm always rethinking, but to some degree, but um, I'm definitely concerned. Uh, I'm not, I'm not making any changes at the moment, but I am watching carefully. I mean, it is a big concern. ART just announced yesterday the closing of Wild, which I think Mary and I both saw and enjoyed because there was a COVID scare. The Rockets have closed since to the end of the year. So the me. NHL has closed. I mean, it's a, it's a big concern. And, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, one of the great things, again, about being an arts organization is that we are, our brains are filled with ideas. So we, we pivot, even though I hate that word now, I despise <laughs> it with all of my being. We've all used it today. I know, but we all have to pivot, <laughs> but that's what we have to do. And, and who knows when this thing will be over? I, I just keep counting the number of Greek letters that, exi that exist in the Greek <laughs> alphabet. Um, but the, the other thing I would say is that I, I can't imagine being in close proximity to, proximity to that puppet. I would have been a sobbing mess because I think we need art to help us release um, and to connect. There's nothing like art and food that brings people together. And uh, I wanted to share a little bit of a statistic about the kinds of things that art can do. And I think that as we look at recovering as a nation from all the stuff we're going to, but particularly this pandemic, um, we have many examples of great successes that existed in the world. So at, in 2006, eight months after Hurricane Katrina um, sort of devastated New Orleans, um, the city supported the jazz festival and centered it to help bring tourists back to New Orleans. It was a two-week festival. In that two-week festival, 300,000 people came with an economic impact of $250 million. And then similarly in New York City, when New York City was going bankrupt in the late 70s and early 80s, they all got together. All these different industries got together. So you got, you got um, the entertainment, you got um, tourism, you had restaurants, you had hotels. They all got together and said, what are we going to do? And they came up with that I Love New York campaign. And at the center of that campaign was... Broadway, right? With Liza Minnelli and cats and, and chorus people in, in gold costumes. And that turned everything around for New York. It became, it went from being bankrupt to being one of the richest cities in the, in the world. And so art can do so much beyond helping to heal. It can have a huge economic impact. And I just think that as we think about all the things that we need to happen in the world in the next 10 years, Think about how art can be a part of that, because I think we can get the message out there about climate, about democracy, about COVID. There's so many things we can do to help housing, um, food insecurities. We can help get the message out there in a way that people can feel. Mm -hmm. I think you hit the nail on the head. I, th I think you humanize the problem and it's right in front of you and you have to react to it. I mean, I think that's what you said about the puppet. The puppet speaks in a way that any amount of footage on the news at night doesn't doesn't do anymore because we're immune to that. Right, it just moves you. The quickest and, road, um, the quickest road to humanity is art. Mm. So um, we know that art has the ability to transform uh, us and create change. And I just want to mention, Philadelphia has a very amazing mural arts project. It has 3,600 pieces of art, uh, mural art around the city. And their vision was they wanted to use public art 
to transform space and individual lives. Uh, you've just spoken about this uh, in the Starlight Square project. Um, and talking about history, uh, we used to have a lot more public art historically in the United States. I was looking it up and back in the 30s and 40s, the Federal Art Project, which was part of a post-Depression New Deal, began funding visual arts and it had 10,000 artists around the United States at that time heading up that, um, which shows you how things can go through waves in terms of bringing back something and making it vital and important. Um, and I think we know all the data is starting to come in now that, that public art improves things like street safety, encourages tourism, it creates new jobs, it combats social isolation and anxiety. So people feel safer when they're on streets with, with public art. So this is not a new idea. Um, I think what's new is we've got data to back it up now. So what do you have to say about all that? Do you think we need more funding? Silly question, really. <laughs> I want all the funding. I want all the money to go to the arts. No, I, I, I mean, you said it all just now that that it, public art does so much. I mean, that that federal project was such a great idea because not only did it get money in the hands of artists who so desperately need it, but it did all the things you just said, which is it encouraged tourism. People came to see it, and then they spent money on all those restaurants and shops that were around around the public art. If there's ever a city or a town that needs to revitalize a specific area, art will do that for you. Um, I've been reading a lot about um, from Daniel Pink and Richard Florida, who are sort of modern philosophers, and they have coined um, the idea that we're at the dawn of the creative age or the conceptual age, which is to say that all of the world's problems will be solved through creativity, which is why we have to invest in it, which is why we have to surround ourselves with it so that our minds are expanded to the creative process because it is creativity that will imagine solutions. Uh, and that means that there has to be an investment in it. And so one of the things I've been saying to all, our, all of our legislators is that we have to do this. We have to get kids when they're really young because there are so many um, reports out there that says, that if kids don't get exposed to the arts before the age of eight, it's hard to convert them into patrons of the arts or lovers of the arts or artists. Um, but the other good thing about this is that because we know that we're in this sort of creative age where the right brain will be really dominating how the world functions, we also know that the investment that we made during the agricultural age to the farmers and the industrial age to the factory workers and the information in the during the information age, the content creators, we have to invest in the creativity sector right now because those countries that make that kind of investments are they going to be the countries that are are leading in in, in everything. Uh, it's so vastly important that we we make those investments, not only from a government perspective, but from private citizens as well. Anyone listening to this 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 interview, invest in your local arts um, organizations. That is where I think that is where life is. That is where community is. Kudos to you, and also the same. So probably Catherine would say the same thing. Um, and I think you said a good point here, which is that. It has to be front center in, in the mix of it all. It can't be some sort of peripheral thing, the arts. And I think there's a new project, isn't there? The Foundry that's coming, developing in mm -hmm. Boston, which is going to be kind of part industry, part work site and part arts, artist workshops all in one space. Is that right? I don't know. I could have well, the foundry in Cambridge, there's a foundry in Cambridge that's being created and it's going to be maker space, one. artist space, education right. space. There's also 585 in Kendall that's going to have some um, really state-of-the-art spaces in terms of performance. And it's, and it's been created in a way that it just sort of spills out into this big courtyard and other area. There's performance area kind of everywhere. Um, I was thinking, Michael, too, about what you were saying about, um, I think, another important, you know, Richard Florida with the rise of the creative class back in the 80s. I mean, he, this has been a drumbeat for a long time now feels a little bit different in that um, in that now finally like urban planners are, are pulling into the idea of what is the intersection of art and functionality? How do we create new communities 
that can uh, enjoy art in a different way. So I think that's like, how do we build, like really build, like put together homes and, <laughs> and, uh, and mm. uh, buildings that make sense for people to enjoy art. I think that's a critical piece too. Yeah. And I think when you look at um, the most competitive cities, um, in the country that are competitive for tourists, for students, for visitors, for businesses. When you look at whatever makes up those top 10 lists, arts and culture always are at the top of the list. Um, so those communities that really want to kick ass and be the best places to live and work, invest in the arts and use the arts to make sure that um, the community feels like the community you want to live in. So here's a nice uh, endorsement for you, Shan, uh, from Shannon, Catherine. My teenage son is a ballet dancer, and naturally all in-person classes were cancelled indefinitely. We attended the Jean Apollon Social Justice Dance Workshop in October 2020. Part of the experience was being encouraged to jump onto the stage at Starlight Square and participate. It was the first time he had danced in person in many months, and we both shed tears of joy. Oh yeah, that's John Apollon. John Apollon is a hugely talented Haitian uh, local artist. That's wonderful. So there we have it, first first-hand proof. All right, so let's talk about some other aspect now, which is this new project that uh, Mass Cultural Council uh, has funding, this social prescription project, fully funding this year, which provides cultural experiences to individuals working with professional caretakers as a means of treatment, which is kind of demonstrating your organization's belief in the arts as an ability to heal um, and help. Um, I would like you to explain a little more about that because coming from Europe, I know for years in Europe, you could get art and music therapy as part of mainstream mental health counseling uh, that was all covered by the National Health. I knew several people that did it. Um, so this is also being um, co-sponsored or, or conducted by Johns Hopkins. Is that correct? I'm not Steve? sure how. I'm not sure how much they were involved. We're actually working right now more closely with the University of Florida, sort oh, of Florida. Med yeah, yeah, medicine and health department. But so the idea, um, so the idea of art therapy has been around for a long time. There have many reports and studies done that show that art can help people heal both physically and emotionally. Um, and so, you know, the U S is a little bit behind on this, um, on this usage when it comes to more sort of publicly recognizing this and maybe even publicly supporting it. But a couple of years ago, my predecessor, Anita Walker, um, traveled with staff to Europe to sort of investigate some of this. And the idea that came back was sort of social prescription. So basically the idea is that we train organizations to work with healthcare providers in um, supporting people that have mental health and physical health issues. And then um, doctors can prescribe art as opposed to medicine to support healing. So if you think about it, someone that has a mental health issue, I could say, hey, here are five tickets to go to Central Square Theater to see their next five shows. And that can help them heal. And they'll work with the healthcare provider and the theater to figure out how they can support their mental health needs with that, that program. So we've been piloting this for a couple of years now. I think there are 12 or 13 organizations that are working with us. Our goal is to scale it up. The issue that we're having is that we are doing the reimbursements um, and that becomes expensive mm -hmm. um, for a state, state funded agency. And so what we want to do eventually is to sell this idea to insurance providers so that they can do the reimbursement. I think it'd be a great benefit to add to their packets and then really get the idea out there to healthcare providers all over the state to really start prescribing art instead of medicine, if appropriate, and then get the insurance providers to directly reimburse the, 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 the providers of the art for that. I think it's a wonderful idea. And certainly with, with my own past mental health issues, the thing that got me out of that was art. I mean, I think the one of the reasons why I'm here is because as a young kid, I got to experience art and I was like, Oh, escape from what's happening in the world. And so I think other people can, can, can benefit from it. And it's another example of how art can really be at the forefront of 
all kinds of social issues if we just embrace the creativity of it all. Do you want to add to that, um, Catherine? You were saying a lot could happen in 90 minutes and a live performance. Right, right. I agree. Um, I think it's a great idea. I mean, we have a lot of education arts programs are created to do just that. I mean, rarely are art education programs created to create created to make new artists. We have a program called Youth Underground, and and its purpose is is not to create more artists necessarily. Its purpose is to create work that helps teens um, uh, understand their civic responsibility and work within the world that they're in now. Uh, the current play they're working on and is, um, and it's interview based play. So they do a lot of different interviews and then a playwright works with them to create the play and then they tour it to schools and community centers. Um, this current play is gonna be about mental health and young people. You know, We know that COVID has caused uh, done terrible things to young people and the suicide rate has increased, depression has increased, anxiety, all those things. Um, so, so part of the prescription is that kids are involved in and then see and participate in a play that's been written by young people for young people. Along with professionals. Uh, last week we had uh, Benjamin Sander, who's full of life and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that when they have return tickets at the Boston Youth uh, Philharmonic, uh, yeah, the Philharmonic, he said that they give them to Rosie's place because he said, these are people that never probably get the chance to go to a classical concert. And his idea is that everybody loves classical music. They just haven't heard it yet. They just don't know it yet, <laughs> which is this wonderful view. And I, I you know, I think it's, Perhaps the, the things that have had to happen in the arts have made them more accessible. Because you were saying, Catherine, you think going forward now, there's probably going to be two audiences forever. There's going to be the people that show up and come to the theatre and people that maybe want the digital product. And that's a new audience, really, you're tapping. I think yeah. so. And it's not just people who want the digital product. It's also people who need that because they don't have access any other way. And, and that's been a afford. huge, exactly, yeah. uh, lots of things, money, physical space. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that theater doesn't necessarily feel um, right for everyone. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. These are people who we haven't been able to serve before that we will be able to serve now. And of course, we also hope that people who are able to come to the theater will watch digital performances and feel like, you know what? I think I want to see this live. I want to mm -hmm. be there. Mm -hmm. Very good question just came in. Elaine asks, how do we communicate this understanding and apply pressure to the decision makers in public education so that the arts play a more core role in curriculum in order to help develop our young people? Yeah, there, well, there are a couple of things. Um, one, I think it's a numbers game. I think that the, the, the decision makers about policy and who, who builds the the, the funding for our arts education programs and also those that build um, the curriculum need to hear from enough of their constituents to know that it's really an important issue. Um, and so there's some grassroots efforts that I'm talking with my colleagues at Mass, Mass Creative about to figure out how we can build up our numbers to make sure that there is that there's not too much of a reliance on nonprofits to fix some of the problems with the lack of arts education, but there is really legislation to support um, the need to have more arts education in, um, in organizations. But the second part is that um, you all listening have to talk to your, your superintendents at your, at your, in, your, in your towns and say, this is important to us and, and get your friends and colleagues. I'm hoping that um, in the coming years, um, Mass Cultural Council is just having a conversation about um, adding to our service agenda um, where we are using our platform to gather those people in a room. So for instance, can I get all the superintendents in a room to talk to them about arts education and bring in 
experts um, from not only the, the Commonwealth, but across the country to show how they've seen a difference in students and their work um, and in their, their, their love of the art, but also how it affects their other learning um, to really impress with them how to do it. And then hopefully make some funding available for them to incorporate more art into the curriculum. Um, and same, similarly, I, I want to get all the CEOs of every chamber of commerce in a space to talk about how the business community and the arts community can work together. I want to get developers in a space to talk about um, how you can creatively include art in all your development projects, and it's going to make your project even better. So all those things are things I'm thinking about um, in my during my tenure at Mass Cultural Council. Not not too small a list there if you take uh -huh. it. <laughs> so somebody else has uh, right, asked um, about literary arts. Authors and poets are a mi minor part of Mass Cultural Council's budget. Can this be expanded? Simple answer is yes. <laughs> what two things? One is that we do support a lot of cultural and literary works through our partners at Mass Humanity. So mm -hmm. there is funding there through Mass Cultural Council. Um, but secondly, uh, one of the things I noticed is that our um, artist funding, uh, I think we were giving out 75 grants a, a year, but we had about 800 artists applying. And so that, that's not really meeting much of the need. So we doubled it this year. We're funding 150 artists and I'm hoping to keep doubling it as I increase the funding um, to Mass Cultural Council. Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, you're right. We need to, we need to do more and we will be doing more. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground here because we've um, talked about the importance of funding. We've talked about the diversification and inclusion that's occurred in this last couple of years, that obviously the challenges, some of them are still uh, insurmountable, you know, the, the virus managing the virus. But I think, you know, it is a good time to be in the arts, even though it's tough in some ways. I mean, it's exciting. Do you feel that? I am. It's always a good time to be in the arts. <laughs> 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 and we need creative people now. There's just no doubt that not, all, you know, we are critical now. Creative people are critical in today's world. Just to me, it just proves that more and more. Yeah, and sometimes we creative people are using creativity to to make the world not a good place. I think about the voter suppression laws that are coming out. That's a lot of creativity, people sitting around thinking of ideas on how to oppress certain people. So we need even more creativity um, than normal. I, it's interesting because I took a job in the middle of a pandemic, um, which is which is not something I would recommend because I don't think they taught pandemic um, survival in arts management school, or either I skipped that chapter. Um, but it is very exciting. I mean, this is this is a lot of history happening right now, and it's kind of exciting to know that we'll be a part of history. And and I think my my dream and my hope is that I can be on the right side of history. And so when they talk about this, what happened in 2020 through 2025, um, they will hopefully say Michael Bobbitt did really good things. That's my hope and my dream. And Catherine, you're continuing to do good things. So um, keep up the good work over at Central Square. Well, I know you can't believe it, but an hour has flown by. And um, I hope we've been excited and uh, informed people on some, certain aspects. There are a lot of links that uh, we'll, we'll put up. We'll put them on the website afterwards if anyone wants to follow up and find out more about this. So I'd like to thank Michael J. Bobbitt from Mass Cultural Council, Catherine Carr Kelly, from Central Square Theatre. And hopefully we'll all be back to busy theatres, auditoriums and galleries in 2022. That's my hope. So Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, the Cambridge Community Foundation and you. So step up, join the mailing list. And if you haven't already donated, you can via www.cambridgeforum.org. There you will find podcasts of this and all our other forums, as well as links to newly 
digitized classic recordings we've re-energized and revamped so thank you all um happy new year and keep up the good work thank you thanks everyone thanks both of you